How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Oh. Ooh, and add a little vaso there. Was that a vaso? Would that be referred to as a vaso, Dr. Joe? No. Basso with a B, not a V. A basso, basso. Like, a, like a bass, you know, like that deep, you know, operatic. It was wonderful, very nice. A basso, all right. Yeah. I'm down with a basso. There you go. Right. Nothing like a good basso. How's the week been for you? Uh, it's been great. It's been great. We opened uh, New Hampshire. I was working out in New Hampshire for a little bit this week, which was interesting. What is going on in New Hampshire? Well, lots are going on. Live free and die in New Hampshire right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're opening up a Styles Law firm up there? No, too? no. We've carved out a uh, portion of our business for specifically for real estate title and escrow. And we have our sister company called Secura Title. And it is now open and operating in New Hampshire. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah thank you. We have a lot to cover tonight, though, so I'm wondering whether you could introduce our guest. I would love to do that, Dr. Joe. Tonight, our guest is Andrew Budson, MD, who majored in chemistry and philosophy at Haverford College before receiving his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. Dr. Budson is a professor of neurology at Boston University, lecturer in neurology at Harvard Medical School, and chief of cognitive and behavioral neurology at the Veteran Affairs Boston Healthcare System. His career combines education, research, and clinical care to help those with memory disorders. And he's also an amazing author, Dr. Joe. Absolutely. Welcome to the show, Dr. Budson. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome Dr. Budson. We are so glad that you are here talking about your latest book. Let's get right to it. Six Steps to Managing Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia, A Guide for Families, uh, with your co-author, Maureen K. O'Connor. Right? So I, I think this is such an important topic, especially right around now uh, with the holidays coming and, and how much that may stir up memories in those folks who may be caring for theirs, their loved ones with memory difficulties. So how did you, how did you get interested in this topic at all? Yeah, and so uh, I actually got into this topic uh, really because I have a, a passion to understand how the mind and the brain work together. And uh, uh, Mark mentioned you know, in his little intro of me that I double majored in chemistry and philosophy when I was in college. And this was, you know, the idea was to get at both ends, you know, to understand the biology part and to understand the sort of mental cognitive processes part. And although I thought about, you know, do I want to get a PhD or something like that? I said, no, you know, I really want to do it. I want to combine it in human beings. I want to be able to understand it in people. I want to be able to take care of people that have these types of problems. So I really approached it sort of, uh, sort of from an intellectual way, but then put the human uh, piece of it uh, together. And I've always combined uh, both my sort of love of research and trying to understand how those things uh, work together with my caring for patients. So in some of my research now, I actually put 128 EEG electrodes on people's heads, people with normal memory, people with Alzheimer's disease, and we uh, induce them to recall true memories, sometimes to recall false memories, and we can look and see how the biological activity of the brain is different. And then in the last 10 years, I've also been working on new strategies that can help individuals with mild memory problems remember things better and stay independent in their daily lives. So I'm just fascinated. So what are you, what are you finding on the EEGs with these folks? 
<clears throat> yeah. So there is a, uh, a part of the brain at the top back of the head called the parietal lobes. And it turns out that when someone has a true memory, this peak lights up. It, it gets much bigger. And what, wait, wait, what, so, what, what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean a true memory? What do you mean? What, so, what is that? A true memory? Yeah, yeah. So a true memory would be like, you know, someone asks you tomorrow, you know, do you remember, you know, during the interview, you know, talking with Mark? You say, of course I remember talking with Mark. And then someone says, well, do you remember talking with Tom? And you might say, no, I didn't talk with Tom. Tom was doing the play. But let's say somebody asks you three months later. Oh, three months later, you'd be like, yeah, I remember Mark was there. And what about Tom? Was Tom there? You say, yeah, I remember. Tom's on all our shows. Of course, Tom was there. So, so that would be an example of a true memory and a false memory. And what's so interesting as far as I'm concerned is that the part of the brain that registers those memories lights up for both the true memory and the false memory. Wow, that is very interesting. And just, just so folks know, EEG stands for, can we just tell them what it stands for? Yeah, it, uh, electroencephalogram. And it's just like you do an EKG of the heart and you see right. the electrical activity of the heart. It's the same thing, but we can actually see the electrical activity of the brain. Yeah, it's so cool. And so for both real true memories and false memories, the same part of the brain is lighting up? Yeah. Now, wow. there, and there are some differences, however. It turns out that the frontal lobes right behind your forehead, yep. they know something's up when you're having a false memory. They often turn on too, and we think it's, it's that little inkling in the back of your head, and you're sort of mentally scratching your head and saying... Sorry. It would be the front of your head, though, right? The front yeah, of your head. You're scratching, head. Go, go, you're go, scratching go, go, go. the front of your head, and you're saying, wait a minute. Is, did that really happen? Did that not happen? Um, but the, but the, the bottom line is that false memories can be very vivid, and people think that these things actually happened. And one of the reasons this is a relevant topic tonight is that individuals with Alzheimer's have a lot of false memories. And this is one of the things that families can sometimes have a hard time dealing with. Wow. So I wonder, can you just tell us then what, what is Alzheimer's versus dementia? Are they different? Yeah. So dementia is a general category that simply means that thinking and memory have deteriorated to the point that it interferes with day-to-day -day function. And the way I think about this term dementia is sort of analogous to the way I think about another general term like a headache. Now, people can have a headache from a lot of different things. You can have a headache from a muscle tension headache or a migraine headache, neither of which are very serious. But you can also have a headache from a stroke or a brain tumor, which obviously are serious. And with dementia, it's the same way. You can actually have dementia from something as simple and as treatable as a vitamin deficiency or a thyroid disorder. But you can also have dementia from a variety of different brain disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, which is dementia due to strokes, Parkinson's disease dementia, and there's many other types. So dementia is a general category, and Alzheimer's is one type or one kind of dementia. It's a lot of stuff in there to talk about. Where do we go from here? Because the, the guide for the families, I just wanted to start off just by reading a couple of these quotes, of these prefaces. And by the way, the, the book is great, folks, because it, it takes two stories of, of two people um, and weaves it uh, throughout the book uh, while incorporating the brain science, but also incorporating very, very wonderful sort of instruction, guidance, if you will, better than instruction, guidance for those. But, you know, here's, I'm just going to read this one quote. Um, 
I love my wife, but I have no time for myself. I haven't been able to go to the gym or visit my friends or even see my doctor. And then another, I don't mind cleaning up when she doesn't make it to the bathroom, but now she's fighting me when I try to get her washed up. How, how do we start? Let's start with, with managing these problems. Dr. Butson, how do we begin? Yeah, so uh, step two is manage problems. And we have, uh, we begin with talking about uh, general uh, approaches that can be used in a lot of different situations. And I'd love to, to quickly go through one approach with your listeners right now. Great. And that is the four R's. So this is a, a good general approach that lots of people can use. And, you know, so let's say we have the uh, scenario with another quote in the, the preface where, um, you know, the, the family member says, it's happening every evening now. She keeps saying that she needs to go home, but we're already home. So you can picture uh, this individual with Alzheimer's and later stage dementia. She's like rattling the front door, trying to open it up. And although we might feel like yelling, honey, you're already home. Stop trying to leave the house. You know, we sort of know that's not the right approach. And so what we recommend is that uh, uh, families use the four R's. So the first R is reassure. So we wanna reassure our loved one that everything is okay. Second R is reconsider. We want to reconsider things from our loved one's point of view. From her point of view, it may be that she's thinking of the home she grew up in. And so mm. for her, it makes perfect sense that she wants to leave and go back to that home. The third R is redirect. And we want to redirect our uh, loved one to things that are both reassuring and calming, as well as distracting. So that might be looking at an old photo album, listening to music, watching something on TV, having a snack, whatever it is. And then the fourth R is to take in a deep breath and relax. Because as a caregiver, it's very important that we are not feeling and displaying irritability, you know, aggravation, feeling angry, because we'll reflect those emotions to our loved one and just escalate the situation. Yeah. So after these general approaches, we then go on to deal with specific types of uh, problems. And we so next have a chapter on memory problems. And, you know, as an example, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the show about how false memories are common in Alzheimer's. So, you know, the individual with Alzheimer's might talk about, you know, seeing their, their uh, mother and father and having a conversation with them. And, you know, you're thinking like, your mother and father have been dead for 30 years. What are you talking about? You know, but, you know, again, this is something that we don't want to argue with them. And I mean, sometimes we feel like, you know, we're used to dealing with our loved one, whether it's a parent or a spouse or a sibling, we're used to dealing with them as a rational person. And we all have the instinct of wanting to continue having a rational sort of conversation and sort of arguing with them, you know, that uh, this doesn't make any sense. But it's much better to just sort of go with it, ignore it, say, oh, that's nice, and then redirect them to something that's more reality-based. Mm -hmm. We then have chapters on language. And one of the things that we talk about is not only is word finding common in dementia, but people generally lose the ability to comprehend uh, written and then spoken language. And uh, we want to remind everyone that pictures can be a wonderful way to communicate with your loved one when the language is starting to break down and that uh, our loved ones really pick up on our tone of voice, our facial expressions, our body language. So it's really important to pay attention to those things as well. We then talk about vision. And we talk about how vision deteriorates 
and it can be difficult to do things like go up and down stairs and how lighting and contrast is important. But we also talk about what do you do if your loved one uh, uh, thinks that you are no longer their spouse, but thinks you're their parent. And what do you do if your loved one thinks you've been replaced by an imposter? Like, you're not the real Joe. Where's the real Joe? Because mm -hmm. uh, things like that can happen uh, as well. And again, as you probably uh, uh, would anticipate, you know, we recommend not arguing about these things. Just say, oh, okay, well, well let, let's, let's work on uh, things that are more reality-based. Uh, we then go so, on to- uh, well, let, let, let me stop you for a sec, because yeah. there's, there's so much here. Before we go on to the next step, how, and maybe we get to here later, but here you are, the family, the caregiver, but you're also seeing the erosion of your loved one. I mean, these steps are fantastic and so important to be able to do, to redirect, to not engage in that way. And yet part of you, your heart must be breaking. Yeah. So do we get to that in the book as well about how you care for yourself as yeah. you're managing this? I don't want to actually... Absolutely, a absolutely. No, it is really, it is really hard, and I would say that particularly for spouses, but often, you know, for for uh, children uh, 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 of individuals with dementia as well, it's coming to grips with that relationship, which really means that at a deep emotional level, you have to sort of let go, mm -hmm. and know that the person that you used to deal with uh, and love before is, if not gone, they're at least diminished, they're at least different. Mm -hmm. And so in uh, uh, step five, we actually talk about, you know, how do you, you know, why do these relationships change in dementia? How do you sustain your relationship with your loved one? Even, you know, they can't do the same thing. So let's say you used to enjoy playing cards with them, but maybe you can still sit together, hold hands and play solitaire, you know, do, do something, do something like that. Or maybe you used to go out to dinner in a movie and now you can't do that with your loved one anymore, but maybe you can get takeout and watch a movie at home. So I think those are, are really important. For the person with Alzheimer's, is, is it that every situation is new? Yeah, it, it, it can be like that. That can be uh, one of the, the difficult things. And so, you know, uh, for example, uh, something that came up with uh, one of my uh, patients is that they were absolutely refusing to, you know, take a bath with the home health aid. And it took us a little while to figure out that what the problem was was that the home health aide was, you know, understandably from their perspective, assuming that this person they had been with every single week, you know, for the last six months would know who he was. Mm -hmm. But from the patient's perspective, you know, from the, the, the individual with dementia's perspective, he couldn't remember who the home, home health aide was. And so from his perspective, there's like this strange person he's never met before saying, take off your clothes. And he's like, who are you? Why are you telling me to take off my clothes? So it really can seem new every time. And again, we have to reconsider things from the individual's point of view. But, but that also speaks to the retention of that patient that they know that there are certain things that are right and wrong and certain things that are morally correct and taboo. So, so that indicates there's this, this memory, this, this, I mean, talk about the, the shift from the neuroscience to the, the philosophical reality of what's right and what's wrong. Isn't that part of what it demonstrates? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's one of the things that is so interesting about uh, Alzheimer's disease in particular is that the personality and all of that sort of early learning, you know, all that stuff is preserved. And many skills are actually preserved as well for a long time. And eventually these things will break down. 
both the moral compass will break down and the skills will break down. But for a long time, you know, people can still go through their daily routine and do their, you know, daily activities, even when, you know, they, they don't recognize someone who's been there every single week for six months. So uh, I jumped ahead from step two. So step one, just so people understand, step one is really just understanding dementia and what it really is. And step two is beginning to, to manage some of the difficulties. And, and you were in the middle of talking about them, and I got all stirred up because I was thinking how heartbreaking it is. So let's go back to, to the sequence, step two, then three and four, and up to six. So, yeah. so I'll just briefly say that, you know, some of the other chapters in step two, um, we talk about uh, emotional issues and why depression and anxiety are so common in uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And the short answer is that psychologically, there are few things in our society today that are as terrifying, anxiety provoking and depressing as realizing that you have memory problems and being worried and anxious uh, mm -hmm. about the future. And then there's also changes to the, uh, the neurotransmitters in the brain from the disease pathology. So you really get a double hit. We then talk about all the different behavioral uh, issues in terms of if people are aggressive, uh, whether they should drive or not, how you deal with home safety, what happens if somebody wanders, you know, all sorts of different uh, behavioral issues, sundowning. So the holidays are coming up. And um, sundowning, which means that individuals with dementia often do worse and become confused and sometimes agitated or angry in the late afternoon or the evenings. Um, this is very common. And my advice about sundowning is plan around it. You know, it's like, I can't fix sundowning, but you can plan around it. So you know your loved one's not going to be at their best at 6 p.m. Even though every year you have your holiday get-together at 6 p.m., make it easy on yourself and everyone. Have your holiday get-together at noon, and that way, you know, your loved one can participate and it won't be a huge issue, a huge to-do. Mm. Uh, then we talk about sleep, and I'll, I'll just say, you know, the, the most common uh, reason that there's sleep problems is, uh, you know, like I have a family that, that um, on Monday, I saw them back for a follow-up, but when I first saw them, they're like, doctor, you got to give me a medication for my mother. She's up at 4 a.m. every morning, you know, waking everybody up. And I say, oh, okay, okay, well, let's just talk about her sleep. So what time does she go to bed? Oh, we put her to bed at eight o'clock. Mm. It's like, well, if you put her to bed at eight o'clock, at 4 a.m., she slept eight hours and she's ready to start her day. You know, a lot of it is simple as that, uh, but there's obviously a lot of uh, 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 art to managing sleep. And we talk about how to do all this non pharmacologically. And then the last chapter in this section is about managing all sorts of bodily functions, like how do you uh, uh, make walking as safe as you can? reduce the risk of falls, how do you deal with tremors, how do you deal with incontinence, all sorts of things like that. Then step three uh, is ask about medications. And one of the things that I was so pleased is that the publisher let us put in list after list after list of medications that can make thinking and memory and behavior worse. And we have both the generic names and the brand names. And then we talk about all the medicines that actually make things better. And uh, you know, we talk about what those medicines are, how they can help memory, how they can also help with behavior. And you know, when do you need to sort of go to step two and use another type of medicine? And when do you need to really use a powerful you know, tranquilizer to, to help? But I always recommend going in order. Then in step uh, four is build your care team. And we always start with the most important member of the care team, which is you, if you are a caregiver. 
and uh, my co-author, uh, Dr. Maureen O'Connor, who wrote this part of the book, she has this wonderful saying, which is, you can't pour from an empty cup. So we talk about, you know, how do you fill your own cup? How do you make sure you take care of yourself as a caregiver? Uh, how do you eat right, exercise, uh, you know, keep doing the things you enjoy, see your friends, go to the gym, you know, uh, work if you're still working, pursue your hobbies. Because even if your only goal in life is to be the best caregiver that you can be, the studies show caregivers who take time for themselves end up being better caregivers, having more energy, being able to care for their loved ones longer, and they don't burn out as quickly. What, what stops somebody from doing that? What, what are the barriers that they may have to taking care of themselves? Yeah, really good question. So I would actually say the, the two uh, most common barriers are that people think that they should do it all by themselves. They think, you know, uh, you know, my spouse was there for me or my parent was there for me you know, my whole life or for the last 50 years. And it's my job. I have to do this myself. I need to, to do this. But um, it, it's just like no one person can, can take care of someone with dementia. It's just, it, it's just too hard for one person to do it all on their own. So that's the first part. The second part is, uh, I think, the very real concern that there isn't anyone else out to help there. And so we try to address both of those issues in the book. As you may recall, the first issue we try and address particularly through the stories. We have a, a, one of our caregivers has to learn that it's, it's okay to have people uh, help him. And then it, it, the not knowing like, how do you get people to help? We go through sort of step-by-step how do you engage family members? How do you engage neighbors, friends? And even if it's a small thing, you know, like a friend, you know, maybe can come once a month and sit for two or three hours chatting with your loved one while you're in the other room, you know, getting the, the bills paid or doing the laundry or, you know, or, or going out, you know, uh, to the hairdresser or, or whatever it is. You know, maybe uh, a, a family member uh, lives across the country, but they can do internet research uh, to help you. They can help mm -hmm. set your, uh, your bills to be paid online. You know, there's all sorts of different ways. And we talk about what are the different strategies and ways to do that. What about guilt? Do, do, is guilt a barrier to self-care for some of our caregivers? Yeah, um, no, I think it, I think it certainly uh, can be. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I confess being a neurologist and not a psychiatrist, I try to stay away from guilt and talk <laughs> about the practical things that, that, that people can, can do. But I do think that, you know, people can feel guilty for all sorts of different uh, reasons. And, and you know, it is one of the reasons, again, that we put the stories in the book to help people sort of feel better with uh, uh, those types of feelings. Right. And, and for our listeners, you know, if, if you are struggling with this, remember, guilt is really a defense against being powerless because guilt is saying, I should be doing this. I should have done that. And I think what Dr. Budson is saying is that this is a... This is a course of a condition that you're not going to have any control over, but you can certainly influence the way your loved one is living their lives. Am I missing something here? Or? Oh, I agree. No, I, I agree completely. And as I think, you know, you've heard me say many of times, like, you know, it, it, you know, I recommend almost like the jujitsu approach, which is, you know, it's not going to work to directly try and fight against it. You want to sort of go with it and redirect things, you know, the other the other way. You know, it it doesn't help to to fight, but you you know that doesn't mean you can't uh, avoid the problem. Yeah. So we talked about self care, and now what step are we on now? So that's that's step four, 
And then step five is sustain your relationship. And we talked a little bit about that step already about the, the way that um, individuals can, um, can still have a good relationship with their loved one, even when things have changed in dementia. And it really is important and the studies have shown that uh, caregivers who can keep that relationship going end up being better caregivers because they feel, you know, more connected. They feel there's something getting, they're getting something back from the relationship. It's not all one way. And then the last step is plan for the future. And here we begin with chapters about the sort of practical things like uh, this is uh, uh, relevant to, to uh, uh, Mark here, uh, you know, the legal paperwork that you need to get uh, in order, like uh, healthcare proxy, living will, power of attorney, you know, all the financial affairs in order. We talk about avoiding being scammed by telemarketers and, and things like that. And uh, then we talk about issues of like, how do you know when you're really going to need either a lot more help in the house or, or think about another living arrangement. And we talk about how do you do that transition so it doesn't become you know, terrifying and awful. You know, we talk about how to do that as, as well as one can. And then the final chapter, when we talk about how do you prepare for the end and beyond. And we talk about things that uh, a lot of people have trouble talking about which is, you know, what does it mean to be dying from dementia? You know, uh, what happens at the end of life uh, for someone? What is hospice and palliative care and how are they different? Um, you know, what happens, you know, what the parts of the funeral you need to worry about? You know, can you donate the brain if you want to do uh, that? And then finally, we talk about how do you get on with your own life if you've been a caregiver for the last uh, number of years and you've given up your hobbies and you haven't seen your friends and you stop working, how do you pick up the pieces and, and go on? Wow, it really is a step-by-step -step guide, isn't it? Yeah, we, we really, we try to make it very uh, uh, practical it, because, you know, in talking with our families, you know, it, some people pick and choose different things, but a lot of them, they just want something to just like read and, and look through so they know what's, what's coming uh, step by step. Wow. Going back to step four, do you recommend that they kind of mourn the person that they knew previously and try to put closure on that memory of their loved one and move forward with the new loved, new version of that loved one? In, in essence, I think the answer is yes. I, I don't know that I would have described it exactly like that, but I, I think that's what we, we do recommend because we, we, we feel it's important to recognize that they're not the same person in the same way that they were uh, before. And so I think the answer is, is yes. And sometimes that means at the very end when they finally pass, uh, they may not have quite as much sadness as they expected to have uh, because they've really mourned, you know, for the last couple of years. Yeah. First of all, where, where can people get the book? Uh, you can get it at all the usual places. I always want to support our local bookstores. So you can go to your local bookstore. If they don't have it on the shelves, they can order it for you. And of course, you can get it from all your favorite online uh, retailers. It, it's available there. Terrific. And do you have a website as well where people can uh, go? I do. It's uh, andrewbudsonmd.com. So andrewbudsonmd, all is one word, dot com. Great. Yeah, great. Well, we were all fair. We were, we were talking a little bit about the medication chapter and Mark had a question whether there were some medicines or some things that you can, you should stay away from. Yes. Yeah. So the first thing that I always want to say when we talk about this in detail <clears throat> is just because a medicine is on this list does not mean that 
you know, you or your loved one should suddenly stop taking it, okay? It simply means that you should ask your doctor or your loved one's doctor about the medicine. Do they need to take it? Is there another one that they could take that can do the same thing? Could the dose be lowered? <clears throat> you never want to stop a medicine without talking with your healthcare provider. But there are a lot of medicines that can make thinking and memory problems worse. And I'll just mention some of the classes of medicines. So except for melatonin, uh, all the other sleeping medications can make thinking and memory worse. Most of them will have a little bit of a hangover effect the next day. And it might be that when somebody was 40 years old and you know they took some Ambien to go to sleep or Valium or something like that, and they were fine the next day, it was no problem. But now that they're 85 years old and they have dementia, their body can't metabolize it in the same way. Their brain is not able to tolerate, you know, a 10% uh, decrease in function. It totally throws them off. So part of the principles here is that many of these medicines are perfectly safe if you're young and healthy, but they're not safe if you have Alzheimer's. Um, in addition to sleeping medications, except melatonin, uh, a lot of the old fashioned uh, over the counter cold and flu medicines, they often have antihistamines in them. And although the new antihistamines are, are, are fine, uh, uh, the older antihistamines that are the least expensive ones, those can really impair uh, thinking and memory. Um, a lot of anxiety medications, the whole benzodiazepine uh, class of medicines, again, things like Valium, uh, or um, Ativan, uh, Cirax, those can all impair uh, thinking and memory and uh, behavior. Uh, pain medicines. Now, pain is important to control, don't get me wrong, but people just need to recognize that all the narcotic pain medications, you know, that have morphine in them or a morphine-like product uh, can impair them. Uh, muscle relaxants uh, like Flexeril, uh, again, they can be very useful, but they can impair um, uh, many anticonvulsants, anti-seizure medicines can impair thinking and memory, especially a uh, divalprovic uh, acid or Depakote can do that. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, not all, but many of the incontinence medicines can also uh, do that. And of course, many individuals with dementia have incontinence. So that's sort of a quick list, and it's not an exhaustive list of the different classes of medicines that you know you should watch out for, and maybe ask your doctor or your loved one's doctor whether these are the best medicines for them. Uh, can they switch to one that doesn't cause cognitive impairment? Yeah, well, it doesn't sound like there are many that don't really. I mean, well, well the blood pressure meds, the cholesterol meds, they're all fine. I, I agree that many of the medications that psychiatrists and neurologists like to prescribe uh, are right. on that list. Right. Wow. There's a lot here. And again, we have so many people in our world who uh, struggle with this. As I said, my, my personal experience is my wife's parents, both of them, wound up having Alzheimer's. And she's worried about herself. What about that, Dr. Budson? What about in the family, how do we care for ourselves before things happen? Yeah, yeah. So in fact, uh, you're going to have to have me back because I have a whole book. On, Terrific. On we will. For, for that. But I will tell you in a nutshell. So the things that have been shown to be beneficial, it can make a big difference. In fact, one study found that these lifestyle changes that I'm about to mention could delay Alzheimer's disease in people destined to get it from age 79 to age 90. So 11 year delay. And so we want everyone to eat right. And that means a Mediterranean menu of foods, which includes fish, olive oil, avocados, fruits and vegetables, nuts and beans, whole grains. And from a cousin diet, we pull in poultry like chicken and turkey. Next, we recommend uh, aerobic exercise, at least, note that I'm saying 
at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And that can be something as simple as brisk walking, could be swimming, can be moving in a pool, taking a, a aerobics class, all sorts of different ways to get that uh, exercise. We know that sleep is very important and we want people to sleep between approximately uh, six to uh, nine hours uh, a day. Uh, less than six hours can be dangerous and more than nine hours, believe it or not, can also be uh, impairing. So uh, uh, six to nine hours and sleep uh, problems and sleep uh, disorders are common. So uh, consider seeing a doctor if, if there's a, a problem there. And then the final couple things to say is social activities are very important. Doing something new cognitively with your brain, something different, something that stretches yourself. And finally, having a positive mental attitude is really important. Now, everybody's asked me, what about crossword puzzles and Sudoku and brain games? The studies show if you do crossword puzzles and Sudoku and brain games, you will get better at crossword puzzles and Sudoku and brain games. It does not translate to overall memory function. So it's all are, the other things I mentioned. We are definitely going to have you back to talk about that book, which is your first book. But we have a few minutes left. We, towards the end of the show, we talk about the I am approach and how everybody knows by this time that we're all doing the best we can influenced by these four domains, your home, social domain, the biological domain, and the I see, how I see myself, how I think other people see me. Because the four domains interconnect, a small change can have a big effect. Dr. Budson, what small change can you recommend to our listeners so that they can manage uh, the Alzheimer's? Yeah. So... I want to go back to one of the things I talked about earlier, which is our four R's. And I want to pick out one of them in particular, which is reconsider. You know, if I had to boil down like everything in this book, it would be all about reconsider things from the vantage point of the individual with dementia. If you consider things from their perspective, you will understand why they are doing the things that they are doing that may seem like odd or annoying or destructive to you. And you can also help them to accomplish whatever their goal is in a way to resolve the situation and make everyone happy, make them happy and make you happy. So we you know, that's the small can, change. It is such an important one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take like 30 seconds to talk about a personal story that my wife had. Her father was in a nursing home at the time and he was becoming very agitated and uh, people were gonna medicate him. And what my wife saw was that there was another person, a woman who was just trying to get out of the door and couldn't open the door. And she realized that her dad wanted to get up and open the door for this person. So I think that's an example. of Absolutely, the absolutely. The second truth of the I am, we control no one, we influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you want to be. Dr. Budson, what kind of influence do you want to be? Yeah, so this question I thought a lot about. And I think, you know, what, what I try to do uh, to influence people, uh, hopefully by example, is to be kind, and to be humble. And I will say that the kindness, I think it comes easy for me. I, I think it's, it's the way I was brought up or part of my nature, or, or you, you would know better than I do, but it comes easy. The humility part I've had to work at, but I have learned, and I will tell you, you know, every year I practice, I really learn that, that although I, I might think I'm the expert, like, there's so much to learn. And um, I always learn from my families. I learn from my patients. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll uh, uh, sort of, you know, run a support group or, or facilitate a support group. I end up learning, I, I think, more than anybody else there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, to be kind and to be humble, that's, that's what I would try to influence. I think that's so wonderful. I, 
What I have learned is that these are my patient teachers and that they are the experts. I'm just the professional, but boy, they are the experts. I agree completely. Hudson, I so appreciate you being here. We will absolutely have you back to talk about the other book. Great. Thank you again so much. Folks, Six Steps to Managing Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia, a guide for families. Please pick it up if you need it. Thanks so much, folks. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks so much for having me.